I was born in Stirling in Scotland in the year 1924 to October, on, on October the 9th to be exact. I got to the age, early age of four, when my mother and father decided to take their separate ways. My father going in, being a member of the British Army in the Argyle and Southern Highlanders. Losing my mother and father in this way caused me to be sent to Quarriers Orphan Homes of Scotland, Bridgewea. The orphan homes, as one can imagine, was quite a tough upbringing, particularly on the food side during the 1930s. And uh, the, uh, the time passed more or less to my way of thinking how it, how it should pass. And I started getting assignment on I suddenly decided to take a walk along a road as I'd seen people moving around in, which was most unusual because we were sort of under lock and key type thing. However, after getting up to my hijinks, I'd done very little schooling at all. And uh, I got the impression that schooling was for the brighter pupils. And this indeed happened. I was left to spend my schooling time sitting in the river, throwing stones and getting up to any other devilment I saw fit to pass the time. However, I got to the age of 14, wrong. An aunt, suddenly I, ha I had an aunt, and she came to take me out of the orphanage at the age of 13, yes. And I went to Edinburgh. I was taken to Edinburgh, my uncle and aunt. I had a brother called William who also was in the, in the orphanage and uh, he was a, a quiet type, good lad and he came with me to Edinburgh and we got put up with our aunt, aunt and uncle. And a year later, my brother became old enough to be put in the army as a boy soldier. He was a year older than me, and he was sent to Stirling Castle, the depot of the Argyles. Me being a year younger, I had to wait it out until I was old enough to go as a boy soldier to the Black Watch in Dover, Dover Castle, to be exact. In our time passed, the war started, we were sent to Perth, to the Queen's Barracks, which was then the Black Watch Depot. 
having get there, got there still with three or four years of boy service in front of me, I, I was presented with the idea of being a band boy, which I disliked. I wanted something more active. And I went to school military-wise because they taught lower-scale educated boys. They educated us. And I quite enjoyed it, and I learned fairly quickly. I learned fairly quickly uh, with the, that knowledge sufficient so to carry me to school in Edinburgh for a short time. Again, I had no desire for learning at all. The, uh, oh no, I don't know. Anyway, let me get back. Sorry, I've, I've slipped a thing. I got to Dover Castle. It was sent to King, to Queen's Barracks in Perth. This quickly passed after being educated to some degree by the Army Education Corps. I went to, I got to the age of 17 and a half and proceeded to do my proper grown-up recruit training. I quite enjoyed this and finished up as a supernumerary NCO. Being a super NCO, supernumerary NCO, I had to go forward for training of recruit of people being sent to the army, whatever age group they belonged to. In this case with me, it was Lanark, Lanark Barracks. I soon got fed up with this and was looking for a way out. And I was passing the, the notice board and noticed that recruits were required, recruits were required for the parachute Parachute Regiment. I volunteered and was sent there the one week and I was gone the next week down to England, Chesterfield in England. What was the reason you volunteered? Because it sounded good to me. It was either parachutists or commandos. And the first ones who were in the throes of training and I guessed that there was going to be a build-up for things to come, something more active, something I can depend on. And uh, as I say, I saw the, the notice board and was accepted and went to Chesterfield to do my training. This I managed to get through without much trouble. From there, done my parachute training at my parachute training at Ringway in Manchester. After carrying out seven Whitley bomber, which were, Whitley bombers were converted into use for parachute training. The, uh, this I quickly got through, balloon, three balloon descents and, and five from the Whitley. The, uh, having completed this course, we were, we were then fully qualified parachute, parachutists ready to be posted to a battalion. In my case, all our course, son there, was uh, sent, were sent to 
the 13th Battalion at Lark Hill in Salisbury Plains, about a mile from Stonehenge. Time passed and training for the parachute. When I got to the 13th Battalion, I was sent to the mortar platoon. I wasn't very keen on mortar training, however, this I had to do and continue to be part of the mortar team until the Overlord, Operation Overlord took place. Overlord being the drop in Durham in Normandy. D-Day was slated for the 6th of June, 1944. We were sent for a, a final briefing down to Bryce Norton and notice that the aircraft we were going to have to use was was an album model. I'd never heard of it before, but it was originally built as a bomber aircraft. It was a twin tricycle undercarriage aircraft. They managed to with practice, we managed to get into the aircraft through the hole, exit hole in the floor and to cut a long story short, D-Day came. The exercise was cancelled for 24 hours. And we took off on the night of 5th of June. Took off from Bryce Norton in Manchester in the fifth night of 5th of June, half past 10. We got over to our uh, drop zone, which we'd been briefed on, we knew exactly what to expect through people already having been infiltrated over to the Normandy coast. And they gave us a go ahead to come and jump. The, the, the D Day, as we know it now, Operation Order Lord, took place on the morning of 6th of June. And by that time, of course, we were in, dropped in Normandy, done our duties as briefed, which ones to do, knocking the poles down and so on. But our, our target was to make our way as best we could in the darkness to a village called Ranville. That was our Brief, that, rather, that was the area we had to make to before first light on the 6th of June. We did this after some casualties in the road, but with the use of our clickers, we stumbled through and got to our uh, base plate position in Ronville, in the high ground on night. High ground in Runville by first light on 6th of June. By this time, we had observation points out and they signalled early on, on D-Day, that we could commence bombing. The number ones and twos on the mortar, which I, I was, uh, I was, just a whipping boy at the time, used for carrying bombs from dumps and one thing or another. And uh, the, uh, they, uh, we remained there 
And to a large extent, after D-Day, we were sent to... We were, sent, we were used for patrolling. So we took over a, a proper infantry training by going on patrol amongst the German thing, who at that time were cosseted up in the landing, the gliders, the horse gliders and hammer car gliders are landed. It was, that was our target area because the, the German soldiers had taken up cover using the album models and the horses in. So we had to patrol in there at night and find out where they were, what they were doing, and take that information back to HQ. On one of the patrols later on, we were used, we were guided in by what be, what became known as moonlight. Uh, it it involved searchlights going up into the sky and lighting up the area, and we used this for a patrol, and this was a uh, actually about the very early point on, I was on patrol there and we were stumbling about in amongst the, the gliders and the Germans must have got heard this and they were nearby, the German troops, and they'd built their own pits and and hidey holes there, so that they had, uh, to cut a long story short again, they found this, found where we were and threw grenades, spud mashers we called them, and I was wounded in the stomach and the leg. For this, I still managed to get back to my base camp at Ronville, which wasn't terribly far away, but I got there and I slid into the trench, my trench in the, with the mortar platoon. And in the morning I couldn't move. I couldn't move at all. In other words, I was numb from my stomach down. And they decided to put me on a jeep on a stretcher and take me back to where the first Dakota aircraft were going to be taken back for wounded in England. I was in the first aircraft going and I was sent back to England. We were sent by train from the airfield up to a place called Newcastle under Lyne. After examination by the doctor, over some period, they were very cagey about opening me up to find out where the trouble was. But it was just a mass of shell fragments with one large piece that had pierced my stomach. Strangely enough, after three days in bed there, I'm talking now, about the hospital in Stafford, they managed to extract that, take it out, but I was still full of little shrapnel wounds, which they said best to be left alone, and they would work out in my system, toilet system and so on. And this happened with me fairly quickly. During this time, Going back to when my, my early stages, when I was born and my mother and father separated, I had no idea, as time had gone, my training and so on, to forget my family if I had a family. However, lying in bed on the third day, 
third the fourth day, a man walked into the ward and said, Is there a laddie in here called Hutton? He was wearing a Glengarry of Fairgale and Southern Highlanders. I said, yeah, that's me. He says, well, I'm your father and I got this notification from the war, war office that you'd been severely wounded and I'm here to show you, to meet you. I said, bloody hell, that I never knew I had a father. What was that like to meet your father for the first time? My father, that, that was it. I said, well, you know, I was fairly coarse about my address to him. And in fact, I had no time for fathers and mothers then because I was a fully grown trained paratrooper. However, having met him over the he said to me, can you get up? And it was a warm summer's day. And I said, yes, I can get through the window. And indeed I did. And we went down and I had the first pint of beer I've ever had in my life with my father. And that was the way I met him. Sometime after the war, we met up again. But by this time he'd remarried and settled down and uh, that was it. During this time, uh, I was sent. I I was when the matron found out that I was fairly active. In other words, drinking beer. She said, "We're going to send you back to Lark Hill, so you'll be joining your battalion again." And indeed. Three weeks after getting the plane to go to the ring, I was back in Normandy again with the battalion at a place called Pont Levesque. I... But I, 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 I sent... I, I spent the remainder of the time in Normandy with the battalion and we returned to UK for for further training for what was to be the Ardennes. We didn't know that we, it, because it was winter and we didn't know anything about the Ardennes. And to cut it short again, we got on a, on a, a ship. They didn't have a, the boats they have now for carrying people across the English Channel. And we were sent across on a, some sort of boat. I, I'm not sure what it was. A battalion. And uh, during it, my, to, to, to bring it up to par, during my time, we had war dogs we had to train. Three war dogs, Flash, Bing and Monty. That was their names. And they jumped out of the deck with us. They had their own parachutes. And uh, it was quite laughable to see them, tails wagging underneath the little parachute. And... Uh, the, uh, when they got to Normandy with three dogs, the two, Flash and Bing, Flash and, uh, Flash, Flash, Bing and Monty, Flash and Monty were lost. They hit the ground and they were taken on patrol and uh, they ran away. So we were left with Bing. Uh, Bing was a magic dog. By this time, by this time, I was a member of the scout platoon and got sniper training. Just in time for us to be sent to the Ardennes, which happened in uh, December 
1944. You're doing very well. Um, I want to go over a couple yeah. of the stories. Carry on. So, why don't we go over D-Day? D-Day, yeah. So, can you talk to me about the preparation you made in England uh, for, for the drop in Normandy? How did you all prepare and what was your objective in Normandy? Yes, we took off from Bryson on the uh, night of 5th of June. We were, we were fully briefed up as to what we had to do on the ground. When we landed, when we landed in the, at the Brigade DZ, which was just a bit north of uh, Pegasus, Pegas, now known as Pegasus Bridge. Uh, we, we gathered together. It was very difficult to get to get, get the platoon together. Our, we were mortar platoon, so we we had to make our... our our target area was Ronville, and we, in the fullness of time, got there. Remember, of course, it was still dark. Having got to Ronville, with the aid of our clickers, which notified if enemy or friend were present. We got to Ronville and uh, one of our tasks was to be in readiness to carry out shelling enemy positions by first light. This we did. I could mention here that we got, we, do, we dug our mortar pit which was some five by six foot wide. And in the middle of that were two mortar plates, which were used as launching off points. So in the containers uh, that were dropped with us in, in the, on the DZ, we had spikes as well as bombs added extra bombs, which had uh, been piled up, ready for pickup by the troops when they landed by a glider and so on, and to forward to us at Ronville. And uh, as I say, we got in position, but we had to hammer these spikes. In. This was to speed, speed up, loosen the ground, to a depth required for launching, because uh, the mortar, the mortars had to launch a high, a, a full height, or a, a low one. So they had to be dropped in accordance with overcoming that. And uh, this was done, and uh, we. We got orders from our operation point to carry on bombing. Oh, there were German soldiers billeted in Ronville, and uh, in the main, they were killing, yes, killing our blokes during the day. And we didn't know exactly where the firing was coming from. One day it was in, the, obviously, it was high ground. Now, on the high ground, there were some buildings, buildings which the firing we found was forth. So we had to go in there on one of the buildings and rout out the Germans. And I think there were two, two women 
members of the German must have been members of officers' wives, uh, but they they were put to being snipers all of a sudden, and they'd, they'd learned this, of course, in the past days, because anyone close to the beaches, civilians and so on, had to be taught how to, if they exceeded, you know, accepted being taught, but... Uh, the, there was a, a number of things happening, too many to mention. Well, the, the, there were things that we had to do, whether we liked it or not. And the, the, the building of the, 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 the positioning of our, our base bay positions and so on were assisted by... by by blowing up the ground and loosening the soil. And as I say, we were in position by, by first light and sent our first down, bombs down. And we were, through this time, we were getting notified by the uh, OPs, the observation points, the effect it was having on uh, enemy positions. And it, did, it was indeed... As soon as we opened up, German soldiers were seen scuttling from one point to the other. And they soon got wise to that, and they, they, they had dig-up points in various places. And we had, as I say, to go on night patrols and find out where they were. This was some two to three weeks after the initial bombing of the area. And uh, on, on, uh, on the, as I said, as I said before, we were discovered on a night patrol and amongst the horse gliders and uh, the Germans threw they, they discovered this. What was it called? It moonlight. Uh, there was a name for it. Moonlight. To to light the area up. Flares. And this, of course, had assisted the. A, a flare. Flares, but the Germans fired the flare, and that ass assisted. We, we were up off the ground. Of course, we hadn't dug in anywhere. We'd come out of the, out the out hidey hole in the horse. And they then threw the grenades at us. Tell me more about that patrol. Were you able to see the German soldiers that threw the grenades? Yes. Well, there were all sorts of... of places which we'd had a look at from from the OP point and we knew exactly where to go at night. And this night we just made our way straight to the area which had to be targeted and this caused my being wounded. Were there any other casualties? That night, no, I was the only one. But I was on my own because I jumped into a trench occupied by Germans. And s such was the speed that it happened. I was in the trench and out again. And that's when, that's really when the bombs were thrown. What happened to the German soldiers in the trench? Uh, well, we threw grenades back, or the guys that and we didn't stop to see any casualties we had to get back because one of the patrol had been wounded, namely Jock Hutton. We're 36 in here. Actually, we ran up right up close. The guys run right up close and just obliterated the thing with 36 grenades because we heard them yelling and screaming and <laughs> carrying on. I was right beside the guys. I, I, I could still walk about, 
you know. It was only after I'd lay in, in back in the mortar, mortar pit, you know, we all we we all had Nobby Clark and I had a, 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 a you know what they call a, what they call the Germans. The only thing we had to dig with was an entrenching tool, which we carried in our backs. But uh, to, uh, to, you know, on a thing like that, we'd patrolled there before, and the Germans, the uh, OP point had said that there's movement still there, and that's when we had to go back because we'd already been there on a night patrol without coming up against anything at all. What weapon did you carry with you? What weapon did you carry with what you? What weapons? We carried stun guns and pistols, four or five pistols. Those were our personal weapons. But we had stain guns as well. On patrols, we carried stain guns. But uh, any time we definitely saw enemy troops, we opened fire. But uh, remember, by opening fire, you gave your own position away. And the place, the area we were operating in then, was fairly full of German troops and uh, we couldn't afford to, life-wise, stick around too long. But immediately we had a set target, we'd go for it and open fire. But remember, night patrols are night patrols and it's all in darkness. What was the closest that you got to the Germans in, oh, in a firefight? I've walked over the top of them. I've walked over the top of them when they've been wounded. Where was that? In, in Normandy as well, yeah. Can you Remember, the Germans suffered a lot of casualties, eh? We had to do daylight patrols as well because the infantry... We were all trained infantry soldiers, therefore we had to thicken up a day patrol by an officer and a platoon in daylight. And uh, this day, I always remember, it was Lieutenant Burton, and uh, he said, fix your bayonets. I said, bloody hell, I have to get fairly close. But... Uh, we could see the German troops just across the way. Because remember, they were daylight patrols. But they didn't open fire. And uh, he said, OK, they're in the trees there, uh, in the hedges. Fix your bayonets and we're going, to, we're going to charge. So this we did. And as we, he said, never mind. Cancel it because all the... Jerry's come up with their hands up. Come up with their hands up. The ones we were going for. Did they surrender before anyone yeah. fired? Before anyone fired, yeah. No, they, they saw us with the bayonets, I think. But they, we were stopped. As we got on our feet, we were stopped. Lieutenant Burton said, OK, stop, get back again, because all the German... All the enemy troops came with a th But a lot of these enemy troops were Czechoslovakians and captured European countries who'd volunteered for service with the German army. Remember, we have related to you what happened after Pont Levec and so on. We returned to UK for... We had to we had to get more trained soldiers in, and uh, 
and we were sent to to uh, to the Ardennes in in uh, January 1945. We got to we got to the Ardennes. Now. We, the build up for the build up for uh, for uh, the Ardennes was the, the the German German army were gradually retreating to their home country so it was with fairly bright you know aspects that we got into the high ground we got our, our target area was in Bure. And uh, what was the importance of Bure? Well, it was a it was a village that was occupied by civilians, and like Ronville, we had to we had to get there, and and if for no, no other reason was to relieve them of the the trouble they were in with the German army. But uh, to continue with their time up in the hill, I noticed as we were approaching the high ground that there were, I thought, were German tanks up in the higher ground. And indeed they were, with the 70, the big guns they carried, the German Tiger tanks. The Tiger tanks. The 88. Say? The 88. The 88. 88, 88 yeah. 88. But, uh, yeah. Remember, by this time, I was a member of the scout platoon and we had gone up in first. So I warned. I said to our position, our positioning was sort of on the slant, whereas they came in below, because we had to get to high ground, because we had sniper rifles. Number four, Mark IV sniper rifles. And uh, we got up to a position, and as soon as B Company had settled down, they opened fire, at least four tanks. They were hauled down, on the higher ground, firing directly down in the Bure, just short of Bure. So B Company, the Germans, yeah, they, they, they used the tanks, who, as I say, were hauled down and, they were, and we lost the whole of B Company, either killed or wounded. 62, 62 people, I think, were killed. From your position, what could you see? What did I do? No, what did you see? What did I see? Well, remember, it was snowing a bit, and it was bitterly cold. It was, it was, it was January the fourth, I think it was, and uh, there was an officer with me. After the shelling, the shelling continued. And they were they, they they opened up with fifty millimeter machine guns as, as well, which were within easy range of their guns on the tanks, and they just got forward a wee bit more, and they could fire the fifty. M and a lot of the guys suffered death that way. Of B Company. B Company, yeah. And uh, what were the shelling and the bombing? There was a hell of a racket going on. And uh, the uh, Lagergen, Lieutenant Lagergen, a Scotsman, he, big powerful chap, he, uh, he stood up after about, we'd gone in there about eight o'clock in the morning. It was now midday. And we had to get away from that position, which 
made it damn difficult for So he said, how many of us have a left? Stand up if you can still run. Because our idea was to go over the fencing and run directly in the Bure, the village of Bure, which we could see. And we stood up, and I think it was another six of us, and they were all scout platoons, strangely enough. None of the B Company. And none of us had been wounded. I remember, we were in a sort of hidden area. And uh, we'd gone down to the hill to see if we could assist, you know. And uh, and Lager, that's when Lagergan st stood up and said, because the German tanks started easing away then, so the firing ceased, but it was too late. What they did was go round the high ground and come down the main road into Bure. But again, the German tanks were suffering fuel, bastoing where the Americans were, down in Bastogne, found that the Germans were suffering because the, a lot of American, I don't know whether they were 101st or 82nd Airborne Division guys, I think they were, I'm not sure, but uh, they were in there and they were suffering a lot of casualties there. And, uh, the uh, the uh, to, to cut a long story short again, they started running short of fuel, the German tanks. They wanted to be fueled up, fueled up, fueled up all the time. And uh, in Bure, we managed to go over the fence and scoot down, and the only area we could directly run into was a pigsty in Bure. It's well known. I'll meet some of the guys who own that place in March next year. Because we run in there and uh, Lagergan happened. We positioned ourselves there and it was most uncomfortable because the Germans knew the area we were in and had fired one of the 88s into the roof of the the pig, piggery. In other words, the roof that was there just disappeared. While you were in it? While we were in it, yeah. What was that like? We were deep under the... We found actual... You know, the, the, it, the floor itself wasn't enough. We could get get underground, as it were, because we had no time to do anything. We had to position ourselves and find out what the hell was going on. Now, we were all scalpeltoon. So Lagergan, knowing us, after we'd settled down there, German infantry came down on either side of the road, hundreds of them, German infantry, with tanks in the front. And uh, Lagergan said, OK, cover me. He said, I open fire with a brain on the platoons coming down. And uh, you remember, there's 28 rounds in the magazine in the brain gun. And uh, he went out with a stain gun of everything and opened fire. He just ran in amongst them and shot and run back in. And an officer in the, in the in the German army, we saw them coming down, but on the blind side underneath, because we were up high. We were we were up high, and uh, the uh, I was up. I, I had a, a way of getting up to a, an opening in the, what was left of the roof and I opened fire there 
I was firing against the enemy troops coming down the road. I fired in amongst the, the platoons where Lagergan was going down to. Yeah, we were. We knocked a few of them over, and uh, the German, the German officer, the German officer, there. He must have singled out where Lagergan was, because he came sneaking up. And I was standing beside Lieutenant Lagergan. I was just about to point out the area we were going to have to get into when this German officer stuck his Luger through the, the hole in the wall and killed Lieutenant Lagergan. The bullet, such force, blew the rear of his skull away. So he was killed. Right, I, tr I tried to hold them. I said, what's wrong? Because I didn't, it all happened. So and I saw the gloved hand with the pistol. Yeah, fucking hell. I was just, just swearing here. That's okay, that's okay. But, uh... What was that like for you? You just saw your lieutenant getting killed in front of you. Yeah, well, we were, we were on our own now. Yeah, so we had to, during the night try because this time we were very hungry we were very hungry the pigs in fact the pigs in Bure were s sniffling at our dead in the roads uh, uh, dead enemy troops whether it be British or German and uh, they were s trying to snuffle up, you know lick and you know, the pigs, in fact, were trying to get down to something edible, and we, our dead, were edible to them. And Lieutenant Lourd, who was further down the road, who was our commanding officer, Lieutenant Lourd, he, he, he was in his HQ, and I thought, no way. It was when, uh, what's his name? Anyway, we had to go out and get some of the wounded in. We couldn't hear, they were crying for help, you know. Help, you know, help. So we, we just had to take a chance and get out. And, you know, we read bands, hospital bands on our, on our thing. And the German armies, Stood because we had to walk amongst them and to load up the the guys that were wounded, especially in leg wounds and so on. And we put them in the ambulance because we had to go out in the ambulance, you see. And, and could you see the Germans around you? Oh, yes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a they had what's known as a as a as a halt in the battle, you know. And I always remember this German officer in first class English saying, we'll allow you 10 minutes or five minutes, or, but it's perfect English. And he said, and then we'll have to continue. That's all he said, we'll have to continue. And indeed they did. But by this time, we managed to get the, the blood wagon, we called them blood, the, the blood wagon, to the rear of where the CO was. Well, the Padre, his name was Foy, Padre Foy, first class. He won the military cross there. And uh, we, we, we went to the hill where all the guys, the, the fatalities were laid out were under blankets. And we had to, remember the ground was rock hard, solid with the ice, the cold. And we had to, it took the monks from the monastery just further round came and helped us to dig the graves for B Company, 
for, for the B Company casual. Well, there was only B Company there. And the war at this stage now, we realised that for Buer, you know, for Buer was over and the, the Germans had gone, mainly because of lack of fuel for the tanks and so on, because they would, be, they would have been slaughtered if they'd come again. Remember, the infantry chaps came up, the Devons, battalion of the Devons came up and helped us quite a bit. Why did he go by himself against hundreds of Germans? To fire his... He did it two or three times. Why? Because it, this was his way of killing the enemy. So that's what we were supposed to do. Because he, 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 had, sting, he had to be fairly close because the stain guns are nine millimetre rounds and it's, you've got to be fairly close. But the, 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 the road was crowded with them coming in to Beer because to them, they saw that the battle had now receded to Bure. So... But uh, the, the, the Lieutenant Lagergen, by the time, you know, after I had covered, I had fired the brain at the thing, this, of course, gave a show away, and, and I was prepared to yell down, don't go, and... Because he forgot about the people coming down close to the buildings. You know, we're up there. They were going up the road there. But we we couldn't see up the hill, you see. I was at people coming. I noticed them coming down the other side. It was the other side of the road. Well, it wasn't a road, it was a track. So, would you say your lieutenant... Was he very foolish or was he very brave? Very brave. Very, very brave. Very brave. Yeah. That's why I say he should have been given the Victoria Cross. Okay. You see, the, it was like a close-knit battle. The dog, we had the dog. The dog was running out there as well. Oh, Bing. We still had Bing. Big furry beast. And he was running amongst them. <laughs> and he scooped back again. The Germans? Yeah. But, 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 but. To, to be awarded for gallantry, you, the CO or a senior officer has to see it happen uh -huh. before you can be put forward for award for gallantry. But the way he was going, he should have got the Victoria Cross. Yeah. But, of course, he didn't know anything about it. All he knew was to get in amongst the... His son came to see me after the war. How? Lagergan's son. How old was Lieutenant uh, when he was killed? Lieutenant Lagergan. Oh, getting on 30. Yeah, he, he was a fully qualified parachute officer. So... The Germans, when they were coming down in the hundreds, mm -hmm. the pig barn, was that directly in their path or it was off to the side? Where was the pig barn compared to where the Germans were coming? But I could see them coming. No, but here. But he, 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 he's, he's, uh, he, he's, he's, I, uh, so, I put my head of the, he said, look, he said, the German troops coming down the other side. Get. So I was filling magazines the brain gun. He said, Jock, can you open fire? So I just put a magazine on and open fire on and, and amongst this group coming on the far side. I couldn't put my head out. I'd have got it fucking blown off. So... What I would like to know is, those German soldiers that were coming down, yeah. if you and if your lieutenant, if you did not open fire at all, 
If you just, if you that, get, that's if, what I wanted to do. I know, but 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 if you just stayed very quiet and you hid in the barn, would the Germans just go right by yeah, you? They would have gone past us. Okay, so the, I said this to Lager, Lager, and we're too small in number exactly. to cope with it. That's what I'm saying. That six guys. It's only six of you. But when my opening fire with the brain gun gave a show away. It attracted this officer's attention as well. So, and when the Lagergan put a uh, went out with the stern and back in again, he was quickly killed by a German officer. But he had to be, he had to be fairly close. He had to be fairly close to kill people with a stern gun. He had to be right up against them actually. But he at least scared them off. He said to me, I could actually see him from uh, where I was. He says, open fire when I go out. And uh, the brain gun, at uh, the distance of where, which was where that next building is, coming down. It seemed the road was crowded with them, Jim. But they were coming down the other side as well. So they were, I couldn't get my head over there. Otherwise, I would soon have been blown off. But he was killed, the German officer. I saw the glen. I was with the Lieutenant Lagan, and he just stuck stuck a hand in. He saw Lieutenant Lagan's head and just squeezed the trigger and killed him. It's not a sniper rifle. It's a group killing weapon. So you just... You, you just... Yeah. Well, that's, I never had it down in this bipod stand. I had it in my hand. Whoa. Whether they were wounded or not, they took cover on the other side. They just, they just melted away. Because I think the German army at this time knew the war was over. Because they were coming, particularly when the Devons came up, you know, the battalion of the Devon, they were a glider born battalion. When they were part of our uh, division, and they, as I say, they came up, and by that time, even the dog had quietened down old Bing, because uh, we had to go up and prepare graves and so on for the guys that had been killed. On the hill. From B Company. But that that was that was when Ardennes was virtually over. I, I said to him, he could hear me. I said, there's a crowd of Deutschers coming down the other side. He says, okay, okay, he said. It was controlled. He says, open fire. And I I was ready and I, I was leant over like this and fired in amongst them. That was a crowd coming down on the other side. And he, in the meantime, ran out and opened fire because some of them were in the wrong direction uh -huh. because they were quite close to where we were. But it's very difficult. But I, I vividly remember Lieutenant Lagergan getting shot. He was shot and killed. Right, right, much closer than you are. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I had a hold of his thing. I, I, in fact, I was reaching round something. I said, I said, uh, don't you think there's rather many there? I said, well, the other guys, other, other five or six guys there said, there's too many Deutschers there for us. You know, we would have been killed anyway. But Lieutenant Lagergan wanted to be seen to be a leader, you know, and indeed he was. He he probably wanted to die in battle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. What happened to the German officer? He 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 went back with his troops. Oh, I thought maybe he, he wasn't was... killed. Okay. Oh no 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 he went back. He went back with his, he was the one who was leading the pack and he directed them 
elsewhere in the nether tag air. I think they got word that British Army troops were coming up. You know. If the Germans wanted to, they could have killed all of you in the pigsty. Right? Yeah. You must remember that we were five people where oh, the heaviest weapon was a brain gun and that was for protection for us. And the Stein gun, the Stein gun was a close range weapon. It was a house to house weapon. It was a house to house weapon. We always carried them when we were clearing houses. German soldiers and enemy troops. So, so after the Germans left, mm -hmm. then what happens to you, the five of you? Well, yeah, well, what happened after G and Lieutenant Lagging and was killed, I and my, uh, I and the rest of the platoon, the, the rest of the, the uh, scout platoon, went round to the area. We thought the CO was in. We went round. This was after three days. We went round there, and the, the Colonel Grease, he says, "Oh, what was he said? Oh, thank God you're still here." And uh, he was so pleased to see his own men, you know, the CO, see some of his own men. We were some of his own men. But uh, we had we had some food, and when everything was settled down a bit, we had to have a burial party to go back up the hill again, which we did, and we got and we got the uh, the padre came along because he carried out the rites, and uh, we just our job was to lower the body you know, down, and he would get up by the shoulders and lay them out, the padre, you know, he would lay the bodies out, but they were all covered. He didn't see any of the faces. Well, we could do if we want, but, you, but you, death, death comes easy in the war. You know, it's a, it's a thing that you all expect, and indeed, I expected to die in the hill. I really expected to die in the hill when when all the guys were getting killed. I actually thought, you know, I'm going to die anyway. So I stood up when Lagergan said, is there anybody still alive? And that's when the, the rest of the guys from the, the other six, six blokes, I think it was six, they were Bill, to, Bill Holding, Bill, Shit, I don't remember their names now. We knew we were being fired at by heavy machine gun fire. But that was at... That was at movement in B Company on the ground, you know. Blokes wriggling about. And I think, big deal, they had to carry on firing. I don't know what... I don't know for a moment can I say, uh, the German tanks pulled out. I know they pulled out, but it seems to make sense that they came around, going down the far side of the hill and came down the road and picked up the infantry coming back to go into Beer. Remember, we ran down the hill directly into the pigsty and we were there when they came. In America, no Sorry? one knows about this. Sorry? In America, no one's heard about this battle. Oh, by the way, well, they fucking well should do. I mean, I mean, uh, the, the battle that you're talking about... At yeah, the Bure. The Bure. Is, Bure. Is, is it well known in the UK? Oh, yes, yeah. Because in America, I, I've interviewed a lot of veterans who mm. fought in the Ardennes, and they've never mentioned it. I oh, know they wouldn't, would they? The, to them, the Yanks won the war. But we, 
And the 5th Parachute Brigade, no different when it comes to Buer and the Ard to the Ardennes, because we'd gone in there. Uh, but the, they'd already, remember, the Americans had already been in Bastogne for some time. And that's the only reason we were sent from England up to to the to the bus uh, to the Bure area, you know. So we went down to Holland and we did, uh, had to do night patrols on the River Mass. The river separated separating Holland to Germany. And what happened on those night patrols? Well, to put it crudely, it was a fuck up. Why is that? Because we had artificial moonlight up again, artificial moonlight, and it was okay at night, but the Germans knew there was going to be activity in the river. We had these canvas boats, you know, and paddles. And we paddle. We specially trained for for down in Holland at Kessel, a place called Kessel. A place called Kessel. Remember the the other companies in the battalion managed to get away fairly well, they, they had wounded people, but it, it gradually died out around the Buer area. And that is when we had to do a bit of cleaning up. And the CEO said, we know through the Devons that, you know, the infantry company who's come on the far side, the German army were pulling off. Where they were going, we didn't know, but they were going back to their own lines because Bastogne really had been captured by this time as well because time had gone on, you know. And I think when we got to Holland, that was after we'd buried, buried our guys in the hill. In fact... There's a burial ground there. It's well known for the parachute battalion and other troops that one can visit. But it's nearly all 13th parachute battalion, you know. But, uh, yeah. But we'd gone to, uh, we'd uh, done our duty by the dead and uh, we... We were sent to, I was surprised, I thought we'd go directly to England. They said, no, you're going down to Holland. So we went to Holland. We had Bing still with us. The dog. The, the dog, yeah. Now, when we left, when we left Bure to go, to go to Holland, we had to go past Bastogne and that, and it was all quiet there. And we went down to Bastogne, you know, the River Mass. We were going, we were going for a bit of night brew. We were walking along and boop, boop, a bloody oh, they were, they were shooting at us most of the time. We used to patrol along the river, along the, along the banks, go down to the river when we were in Holland. And it was dangerous because the snipers were watching. But uh, Jack Birkbeck, another one of our uh, NCOs, Jack Birkbeck. Who else was it there? Guys I remember well. They got the military medal. You know. You, you sound like you deserve a, a military medal. But... No officers there, no nobody watching you, nobody seeing the action. That's what's got to happen. A senior officer must see the action actually carried out before 
he could put it forward for an honour. No, there was, in, in Normandy, there was, I saw some of her guy, some of the guys winning the VC, but they never won bugger all, because a lot of the officers were being killed in, in Normandy. What was the major action that you got into at Holland? Nothing much. Just patrols? Yeah. We didn't sh didn't have anybody killed. Oh, yes. We two two guys killed by sniper fire. They were shot from the, uh, the bank. Before we left for Normandy, before we left for Normandy, everyone had to take all their kit out of the lockers and put it in the kit bag. And the kit bags were left in the middle of the huts. All the... All of us had to pack our kit, the stuff we weren't taking with us, and I'd pack. The idea being that the people who returned from Normandy could get that kit. We had our first pick of the kit that was put there from the people who couldn't come back, either by wound or by thing. We could never return. But there was so much happened, you know, that after all, you know, in the space of a year, from Normandy to the end of the war was a year. That was a, a game the German, the German ACAC fire used to carry out. As soon as any plane went over, they didn't know which, they didn't even know which target their own aircraft were. They just opened fire. They could see it, especially if it was the eyes were used to the light. They just opened fire. The ACAC guns. So, so tell me about the actual jump you made and the journey over to Normandy. Tell me about getting in the plane and getting ready to make the jump. Oh, about get, doing the jump actually. Well. You've got other things to think about. The idea being, get out the aircraft. No matter you kick a side of the aircraft out, get out. Our strong point was up above our heads. And as long as that was intact, that's all we thought about, get down. So how the other guys got out, I got out okay. I swung my kit bag out and out I went after it because such was the weight. They just dragged me out straight away. You couldn't make a, a, a thing me drop, you know. You just had to crawl, crawl along in your arse, as, as it were, and then get you, swing your legs over and you were gone. How high were you when you made the I jump? Mean, just over 500 feet. And... What order were you in the stick? Sir? What order were you? I was in, in the, the number. I was number two. I helped put the, the left-hand side side of the exit point up where, they, you know, where there was a leather tr strap there. We had to put it in the button and lock it up because hold, it was the width of the aircraft, the actual. So, so it wasn't too bad. You know, getting you, but the, 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 it was an aircraft that wasn't a parachuting aircraft. It wasn't meant to be. It was only at the last minute they modified them because they were no longer any good or in use as bombers. So, when you were going over the target in Normandy, what could you see about the ground fire? What did that look like, the anti-aircraft fire? Yeah, well, you, you know, and we could see it through the exit hole. What was that like to see? Well, they slow, and then whoosh, whoosh, they just, you see, look, you take potluck in a thing like a ground fire. It's hit or miss. Were you able to see, were there any other planes that were hit Oh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good point, that, because we used Stirling bombers 
again converted for use to drop parachute troops. We trained in the Stirling, we jumped in the Stirling, which was a hole through the floor as well. And one of the Stirlings was going over that night and it was hit by ground fire and it was hit right in the centre. So the rear end containing, I think it was 12 guys, because they carry 21 men, you know, for parachuting. And uh, they were dropped. And they looked high and low for the aircraft, the part with the guys still in it. And it wasn't until after the war, a villager came up and said we had to bury the guys, you know. And there was a part of the aircraft, yeah. But I didn't see it, but other people did, and...